This video is sponsored by World of Warships. The Hudson River is one of the most dominant waterways in the northern United States, providing navigational access to over 300 miles of upstate New York while letting out and forming New York Harbor. For decades, river steamers provided trade to the interstate by traveling its length. And while that role has diminished significantly in recent times, a completely different fleet now lives in its waters. The Hudson River National Defense Reserve Fleet once counted at almost 200 ships and now sits abandoned and shrinking. But why have such a large number of ships just been left here to rot? Join us to find out as today we discover the history of the Hudson River Ghost Fleet. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. Ship graveyards are locations that command an imagination about what once was. But if you'd like to bring these forgotten ships back to life in a more meaningful way, check out the sponsor of this episode, World of Warships. This free-to-play PC game is effectively a floating digital museum with epic recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. New content is released every month, whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes, which means there's always something new to discover. The graphics are incredibly good, with over 40 unique maps featuring dynamic weather and stunning updates for new water effects and textures. In my opinion, these features make the game's seas virtually indistinguishable from the real deal. Additionally, World of Warships has a passionate and dedicated fan base to connect with by joining the action in game. Participate in discussions on World of Warships official Discord server, tune into live streams, or participate in tournaments. This game is also available on consoles, so don't miss out on the perfect strategic game to take your mind off of things. Download World of Warships by using my link in the description. Use the code WARSHIPS during registration to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. To understand the current state of the river fleet, we need to go all the way back to the times of the World Wars. As America grew more tangled in the fighting and logistics, the Congress and White House realized the risk of America's rapidly dwindling merchant marine. As ships were sunk or lent out to the English and its commonwealth, not enough new ships were being built to replace them. As we covered before, this led to the initiation of the Navy's EC-2-S program during World War II, otherwise known as Liberty Ships. But in World War I, there was hardly such an industrial solution. At the outbreak of the Great War, most European states nationalized their merchant ships to serve and prioritize their own needs. Much of the remaining fleet was seized when caught by enemy or unfriendly ports. By the time this and the U-boat campaign reached their extremes, the United States' remaining merchant fleet couldn't even carry a two-digit percent of pre-war trade and cargo. In World War II, that gap was overcome through the Liberty and Victory ship programs, but Congress could not let that happen a third time. Beginning in 1946, a fleet of mostly Liberty and Victory class cargo ships were stored along the river at Terrytown before being moved to Jones Point at the foot of the Dundenburg Mountain. The fleet built up in numbers for the next decade before reaching its height in 1965, when 189 ships were moored together from Jones Point to the Lovett Orange and Rockland Power Plant. At times, the entire assembly lasted for two miles. When all 189 of them were present and docked, they went on even further. The ships were undeniably vintage, even during the 60s. And as we mentioned before, they weren't expected to survive much longer than five years. But with a crew often reaching more than 200 men, monitoring and tending the ships, they were an impressive sight both from the road and from the water. River steamers with passengers and cargo would have to slow down to navigate this much more congested part of the river, with the old cargo ships using a valuable maneuvering room. When they went by, passengers would take to whichever side had a view of the ships and take in that bizarre but striking sight. On State Road Route 9 West, multiple semi-paved rest points were made for onlookers 
to get out of their cars and look down at the ships. And as you might imagine, each of these forgotten ships had a story. A story that deserves to be remembered. So now that we have the context, it's time to bring their history back to life. In 1941, some Pacific Coast-based companies, like the Alcoa Steamship Company, were still building vessels for commercial use. Laid down in the Moore Dry Dock of Oakland, California in August, one of them, the Alcoa Cruiser, would be destined for a different fate than hauling bauxite across the Pacific Northwest. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the ship was partially rebuilt and commemorated by the U.S. Navy, rechristened as the USS Rixie Casualty Evacuation Ship on December the 30th, 1941. For the rest of the war, she performed unhindered and evaded Japanese attacks as she transported wounded men from the Pacific Islands to hospitals in New Zealand and Australia, returning to the war zone with fresh soldiers and Marines. In August of 1946, the Navy handed her over to the Army, where she was renamed the Private William H. Thomas after a posthumous Medal of Honor recipient from the Philippine Campaign. After the war, she continued her service in bringing American troops and dependents to Europe and return trips to New York. During one routine Atlantic crossing, she received a pair of distress beacons from the Italian passenger ship Andrea Doria and the Swedish vessel Stockholm. When communication officers confirmed both ships were in distress and that the Andrea Doria was sinking, she immediately made for the Nantucket Shoals and was the first ship to respond and assist in evacuations. The crew and vessel were appropriately rewarded the gallant ship award citation for sending their two motor lifeboats on trips to the Andrea Doria side, rescuing 159 passengers before a larger French vessel arrived and carried the majority of the passengers back to New York. Eventually, after spending the next several years in reserve, she made one final Pacific crossing to Taiwan in 1970, where she was scrapped. These ships didn't stay idle. During the Korean War, 130 Liberty and Victory ships from the Hudson Reserve were reactivated to supply joint forces defending South Korea. When Britain and France were instigating and escalating the Suez Crisis in 1956, they diverted much of their merchant marine to supply their expeditionary forces in Egypt. Seeing that this could create a dangerous and expensive logistics bottleneck, the reserve reactivated 35 ships. Eventually, during Vietnam, another 40 ships were deployed to supply the U.S. military again. But by now, the fleet was showing its age. Due to the pressure laid on the mostly amateur shipbuilders for both of these classes going into the late 1960s, they were almost obsolete by any metric. Newer, larger ships were being built globally. And as the Vietnam War ended, the United States lost a large reason for keeping the aging reserve fleet at all. The reason was really simple. Even keeping them in the Hudson River was very expensive. Perhaps comically, you can add to this the cost of a 1960s lawsuit filed by Jones Point resident Teresa Skazawa. In a bizarre interpretation of property rights, the 77-year-old grandmother accused the federal government of, quote, parking a fleet of ships in her front yard. According to her lawsuit filed in the Federal Court of the Southern District of New York, she contested that she had ownership of 365 feet of shoreline at the extension of 250 feet into the river. The Federals predictably contended that the New York court didn't have the right to handle this case, which was denied immediately. Apparently, she was charging $25 per month for the government's shoreside parking, office space, and docks to some of the ships, but sought to increase the price after the original lease expired that year. She, her daughter, and her son-in-law filed a mutual suit against the fleet, but dropped their case shortly after when tugboats moved the infringing ships from the shared property. These ships were an overall challenge. Even with a skeleton force, each ship needed to be oiled to keep their engines from rusting. Their engines needed to be warmed up to full power regularly, or they would rust altogether and lose function. Workers needed to apply rust-resistant paint and oil onto the exterior and machinery. 
The electronics and generators needed a fungus retardant paint and even closer maintenance. They had to sand down rust where it popped up, and as I said, they posed a navigational hazard and choke point at whatever part of the river they were moored. Security had to watch the ships day and night to repel thieves and unwanted tourists. I can't even imagine what the maintenance cycle for these ships would have looked like after the winter months. You see, there in rural New York, snowfall would have been regular and heavy, not to mention the risk of drifting ice in the river, clinging to or buckling the ship's hull plates. By the end of the effort, only two ships were left, although many were moved to the James River Reserve near Norfolk, Virginia. Per the conditions of their selling, they couldn't be returned to cargo shipping. Still, one was powered up and moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where partial modifications and repairs prepared it for a trip to the U.S. Virgin Islands. There, according to the plan, it was temporarily put to use as a floating schoolhouse for underprivileged children. In the Virgin Islands, it was renamed the Miss Opportunity and used for several years before either being scrapped or sunk as a reef. I found videos of divers visiting and traversing the sunken ship, and it has the same name, but they describe it as an old hospital barge. Combined with the fact that the source for this story didn't mention the ship by its original name, I can't completely verify the ship's fate, although in all likelihood, this is her. The other fortunate survivor was the SS Exacorda, laid down in 1943 as a Windsor-class military attack transport and named Dolphin. She served in the auxiliary fleets in both the Atlantic and Pacific, witnessing the war's end in person in Tokyo Bay in 1945. She stayed in the Navy Reserve until 1958, when she was sold to the American Export Line Company. Before entering service with the company, she was extensively modernized and refurbished into a hybrid passenger cargo ship. She and three other former attack transporters were called the company's four aces. They sailed regularly on the New York Mediterranean route until the Exacorda was retired and handed to the Hudson River Reserve in 1959. According to the United States Marine Administration, when she and the other ships were being sold in the late 60s, they couldn't return to transportation uses. Thankfully for the Exacorda, a set of buyers was willing to take her for a different purpose. In September of 1967, the Hoboken-based Stevens Institute of Technology announced a bid for the ship for $130-301, offering to give it a slight renovation and transforming it into a floating dormitory and classroom facility. In October of that year, the Navy agreed with this arrangement, and so it was. She was towed to the Bethlehem Steel Corporation's dock in New Jersey, where she was refurbished into a dorm and rechristened the SS Stevens. The next year, in January, the first students moved onto the ship. She served as a dorm for the Stevens Institute until 1975, when better facilities could be acquired, and she was finally sold for scrap to two companies in Pennsylvania, with the other being in New Jersey. Where exactly does that leave us with the Hudson River Ghost Fleet? Well, like I said, all of the original vessels were scrapped long ago, and the anchorage is more of a public use as compared to a military reserve. However, a lone stone commemorates the fleet at a former berthing, using two ships' anchors as monuments. Still, aside from this, the role and existence of the Hudson River Reserve has been erased from the public memory. However, when I was scrolling through the archives of the U.S. Maritime Administration, I couldn't help but notice something telling in the most recent documents. Since 2020, up to the more modern reports, the number of vessels in the Strategic Reserve Fleet is rarely more than 90 or 99 ships. Might I remind you, at Jones Point, there was once 180. So how can this number shrink so much when international trade and its demands are so much higher than before? Well, one element is cost. Others are manpower and the lack of modern American shipbuilding. According to one Navy report, between 1987 and 1992, only eight merchant ships weighing more than 1,000 GRT were sold from American shipyards. One article from January of 2021 by Freight Waves exclaimed, quote, 
For reasons that are very hard to explain, the Reagan administration stopped construction subsidies from U.S. shipyards without seeking reciprocal actions from other shipbuilding nations. The result was that the U.S. commercial shipbuilding industry collapsed while subsidized Asian shipbuilding companies captured the market. In less than a dozen years, the U.S. went from the leading commercial shipbuilder in the world to producing virtually no vessels for international trade. And all of this has its cost. The age of most of the ships in the Hudson Ghost Fleet was 40 or 50 years old. Yes, but that doesn't mean the modern fleet is any better off. The average age of a ready reserve and active vessel is 44 years old. But at the time of the most recent subcommittee hearing, 17 were over the age of 50. The result has been predictably and possibly more dangerous for America than any previous international war. At a subcommittee hearing this year, the Strategic Fleet Reserve represented by Rear Admiral Ann Phillips reported not to be confident that all ships in the Ready Reserve could be activated in the case of a crisis. On top of the shortage of new ships being built domestically, the Ready Reserve is short by more than 1,800 qualified sailors. When there was an attempt last year to increase recruitment into the Ready Reserve's Marine Force, it fell apart when no congressional funding was approved to manage recruitment drivers. America has had a long and proud naval tradition, but somehow, when it comes to building, it's slipped away as the industry here has aged out like the Hudson Reserve. Even though many of the countries that merchant shipping construction has left for, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan are US allies, the United States makes it a policy, some might feel a senseless policy, that only American ships can be built in the Navy and Naval Auxiliary. Now, if a crisis comes, the US might not be as prepared as it should be. The ultimate lesson here comes down to planning. I unfortunately have to agree that the ships that were in the Hudson River fleet had to be retired and scrapped. No matter how you judge them, they were too old slow and small for modern marine trade and military emergencies. I do wish that at least a couple could have been made into museums at sea or relocated in land, but given the lackluster image most of them presented by the 60s, it's also understandable why that wasn't possible. Still, just because the ships had to be disposed of, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Hudson River Reserve Fleet needed to be disbanded. In 1970, 1,104 American merchant ships were weighing over a thousand GRT. Why couldn't any of those be placed at Jones Point or similar locations? Why let them get sold off to foreign companies or scrapped? They were already built and already flying American flags. Surely, most of the hard work was already done. Well, I never saw it personally. Part of me marvels at the image of hundreds of ships lined up in the Hudson with the morning's fog just above the river and a small company of sailors and engineers tending them. But now, with all the ships gone, I guess all that remains are their ghosts. Until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off. And special thanks to our sponsor. Download World of Warships using my link in the description. Use the code WARSHIPS during registration to get exclusive rewards, including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles.